And we also know things like school programs, peer support, um, promotion events, and driver education and training are really key. So one example of a great, um, a great school program was Beat the Street. It was a global program where uh, they used radio frequency beatboxes to track points to and from school. They used high profile champions, prizes, and the kind of competition approach to encourage kids to walk. Promotion events can be in the form of celebration or themed rides. They're accessible for all ages and abilities, and they really emphasize the fun and sociability of walking and cycling. And I'll take this uh, opportunity to uh, promote the Bike the Night event happening this Friday. Um, it's going to be held along our Arbutus Corridor, which is soon to become our new Arbutus Greenway. So I encourage you to take part if you're available and still in town. Uh, peer support, whether it's done kind of informally or through more formal programs, is another really important approach. And the Bike Host program in Toronto matched volunteer mentors with newcomers, loaned them bikes for the summer, conducted group rides, tours, social events, and training sessions. Driver training and education is also important, and San Francisco, this is an example uh, of an awareness campaign aimed at professional drivers. So for taxi drivers, they uh, included flyers, letters for new drivers, and test questions as part of the mandatory taxi driver testing. So in Vancouver, our Transportation 2040 plan sets a target to have two-thirds of all trips made by foot, bike, or transit by 2040. I'm sure you've heard this probably five times already over the last two days. And it also explicitly recognizes the encouragement and promotion solutions that are essential for the success of sustainable travel in Vancouver. There's an entire section on encouragement, education, and enforcement, including a direction to develop a promotion program. So we decided to tackle that through developing an active transportation promotion and enabling plan, or ATPEP to shorten the mouthful. And this guides our soft approaches in a comprehensive way. The plan outlines seven high-level strategies um, which fall under marketing campaigns and pilot projects, and also includes a conceptual framework for how these strategies will help us achieve those objectives. So the elements of the, the conceptual framework sort of show how the desired behaviors, barriers and benefits, and enabling factors all work together, and how potential strategies can help um, to kind of change points in that flow. And we also identify that trigger events which are sort of major points of change in people's lives, so new relationships, new jobs, um, moving houses, that sort of thing, those, are, those help us with the when and where for applying the promotion strategies. Um, they, they're, yeah, they're times to change, they're times to develop new habits. So we also identified that driver education and enforcement were um, important parts of, of promoting uh, active transportation, but those kind of fall to other, other agencies and other departments within the city. So, they're not so much of a focus for us right now. Uh, we do have, going forward, a budget of $150,000 to implement this plan. Um, a lot of this comes from our existing active transportation promotion budget, and part of it also comes from our um, infrastructure-based cycling spot improvement program as well. So uh, we identified four key action areas to move forward with. The first was market research, and we collected baseline data in 2015. That will sort of be the bulk of the program, or bulk, the bulk of the presentation that I'll focus on in a little bit. Um, monitoring and reporting. <coughs> we just released our very first walking and cycling report card, um, filled with 2015 data. I have a few of them here on me if you want to take a look, and we also have more available at our booth. And pilot projects. So uh, we've been conducting several cycling education and promotional events since 2014. Uh, last year, we along our Comox Helmkin Greenway, we had a celebration of wintertime, kind of cycling, walking, and community um, and music along the Greenway. We conducted a, or sorry, we, we celebrated the millionth bike of the year to cross Broad Bridge with a contest. And so, you know, we kind of thought having a contest for the actual millionth person to cross the bridge might be a little bit dangerous, might kind of encourage some, some rather <laughs> dodgy behaviors. So we decided instead to have the contest focused around people guessing what time the millionth bike would cross the bridge. And marketing campaigns are really our next step. So to focus in on the market research that we conducted, which will underlie the, the marketing campaigns that we're, we're, we're gonna be developing going forward, we took two approaches. The first was to conduct a survey looking at motivations and barriers. So we hired an external consultant. This survey was statistically valid. We had over 1,200 respondents and they were invited to participate through a letter that invited them to take part in an online survey. And the objectives here were to collect baseline data 
um, that we can sort of monitor year over year. And we broke that down by season. So looking at how people behave um, and what motivates them in the, the dark and rainy season, so kind of the October to April, and then in the light and dry season, so the May to September. And we also broke that down by trip purpose as well, so whether people were commuting or were not commuting. We wanted to identify group characteristics, so looking at people who were regular walkers or cyclists or occasional walkers or cyclists, and we wanted to identify the key motivations and barriers. We also conducted uh, two questionnaires that were internal through our existing Talk Vancouver Citizen panel. So we had almost 1,000 respondents to the walking questionnaire and over 1,200 to the cycling questionnaire. And they're called questionnaires because they're, they're not statistically valid. It's not kind of a random, a random sample like the, like the external survey was. Um, and the purpose here was to measure attitudes and perceptions using a method that's inexpensive and it's easy to replicate. So what were the key findings? For walking, we found that distance or the perception of distance was the strongest barrier and the close, uh, having a close destination was the strongest motivator. We found that walking was perceived as a good way to get fit and healthy and that was also corroborated um, in the motivation survey that exercise and fitness was one of the strongest motivators. 93% saw it as a good way to get fit and healthy and over two thirds were motivated to actually engage in walking trips for that purpose. Uh, there was a strong perception that it makes a difference to improving the environment, but we actually found that environmental benefits were less of a motivator to actually get people out walking. Enjoyment and relaxation was a, was a very strong motivator for uh, walking. And saving money, interestingly enough, was not a top motivator, although it was a little bit stronger for commuting trips than for non-commuting trips. And kind of connected with that, only 8% of people agreed that walking is for people who can't afford other ways to get around. And we found that the biggest barriers were related to logistics and efficiency. So again, the distance and that sense that people had too many things to do during a trip or they had too many items to carry. Safety and security concerns were only secondary barriers and only 15% of people were seriously concerned about being struck by a vehicle or a bicycle while they were walking. Inadequate infrastructure, so whether that was narrow sidewalks or inadequate protection from vehicle traffic was not actually seen as a strong barrier. And um, there was a strong perception that walking is good to do all year round, which is fantastic to hear in a city like Vancouver. So what did we find for cycling? We found that distance was, uh, not, was less of a concern than for walking, perhaps not surprisingly. Uh, we also found uh, it, was very, it was very much perceived as a good way to get fit and healthy, and exercise and fitness was actually the top motivator here. Um, about 80% of people were motivated to take cycling trips because, because it was a good way to get fit. Um, enjoyment and relaxation was also a strong motivator. It was a really close second. And there was a strong perception that it makes a difference to improving the environment and um, sustainability was a much stronger motivator for people to take cycling trips than for walking. Saving money was secondary, but it was a stronger motivator than it was for walking. And that should say cycling, but uh, only 11% of people agreed that cycling was for people who couldn't afford other ways of getting around. And the absolute biggest barrier was riding in dark or wet conditions. And the second biggest was needing to do other things or carry too many other items. So again, it's the logistics and that efficiency um, type of thing that was making it hard for people to choose cycling. Safety concerns were a more significant barrier for walking. 50% uh, of respondents saw cycling in traffic and the fear of being struck by a vehicle as a major barrier. Infrastructure concerns were secondary, but they were stronger than for walking. 21% saw a lack of convenient bike routes as a barrier, and 20% felt that not having the familiarity with the bike routes was a barrier. It was not as strongly perceived as a good year-round mode of travel, so we have a little bit of work to do there. And only 8% were deterred from cycling because they don't want to be labeled a cyclist. <laughs> we did not ask the same question for walking. <laughs> So in terms of next steps where we're taking this information, uh, we do have the, the uh, walking and cycling report card, which I mentioned, and all of the, the barriers and the motivations and the perceptions data is um, shown there in a little bit more detail. And we are looking at conducting these surveys again, continuing to do them, if not yearly, at least, um, at least every two years, uh, to kind of track how people's perceptions change over time, if the barriers start to change as we engage in our marketing um, campaigns. And 
I really think that this motivation and barrier stuff will help to inform our marketing and branding campaigns. The next major focus for us will be to develop um, a new active transportation brand, so something that encompasses both cycling and walking, and launching some broad and some more tailored marketing campaigns that speak to the motivations and address the barriers that we've identified. And I think by focusing on everyday people and kind of myth-busting some of those logistical and efficiency concerns and showing that there are ways to carry you know, a bunch of items on your bike, here's how you can do it, or here's how to ride in the rain, here's how to tackle that kind of thing, I think that'll be a really important step in the marketing uh, that we do. And I'm just gonna see if I can scroll this down. So yeah, so on top of selling the experience using creativity, humor, and joy, which of course is something I think that we all know is important, I think that uh, really myth-busting some of those logistical concerns will be key. And as we know, promoting and enabling active transportation is really about empowering people to make more choices, realizing what choices are open to them, and hopefully enjoying themselves as they do it. Um, I am now going to turn it over to who's next? It's Brian from Seattle. Uh, okay, so I'm Brian Doherty from the Seattle Department of Transportation. I oversee our neighborhood and pedestrian programs, which includes safe routes to school, neighborhood greenways, formerly known as bicycle boulevards, and all pedestrian projects, so sidewalk, sidewalk repair, ADA compliance. And I'm going to specifically focus here on our safe routes to school uh, program, which includes a pretty strong component of encouragement and education. Uh, just quickly, this is uh, SDOT's core values and the Safe Routes to School program really fits um, centrally in the top priority, which is to, um, to improve safety. And I'll just talk about how this fits in with our Vision Zero program um, uh, in Seattle and how Safe Routes to School specifically fits into Vision Zero and then uh, some overviews of our Safe Routes to School action plan, which we adopted last year, which uh, is going to guide our investments in Safe Routes to School for the next five years. So again, Vision Zero, I'm sure that um, almost all of you are familiar with this as a uh, vision to reduce traffic um, fatalities and serious injuries to zero by uh, the year 2030 in Seattle, and it includes not only engineering improvements to make our streets safer, but also um, encouragement to get more people walking and biking and education uh, for drivers and for people walking and biking. And evaluation, which is key to, to all this, is to make sure that you've got uh, good data collection so that you can prove the results of your programs. So walking and biking to school um, for elementary school kids in Seattle has increased 60% in the past 10 years from 15% to 24%, which is still way too low and a lot lower than it was traditionally. Um, we're making some good progress, but uh, but there's a, lot, a long way to go. So, um, Vision Zero really fits uh, centrally into our, um, our Safe Routes to School fits into our uh, Vision Zero program. So in 2015, we led the development of the city's first Safe Routes to School action plan called Safe Streets, Healthy Schools and Communities. Um, the, plan, the plan provides a framework for investing resources into school traffic safety over five years uh, and is one of the key steps to achieving Vision Zero in Seattle. Since 2012, uh, Seattle has had a program to automatically enforce 20 mile an hour school speed limits throughout uh, the city at a dozen schools. Um, and the program, the Safe Routes to School program, draws on those funds to support the program. So it's kind of a um, uh, virtuous cycle, if you will. So people who, who violate the speed limit in school zones pay into the fund that supports our Safe Routes to School program. So we're trying, we'd say we're trying to put ourselves out of business. Um, to develop the Safe Routes to School program uh, plan, we actually used public outreach and, and did a pre best practices research to develop 42 specific actions across the five E's, um, which I'll cover in a couple of minutes. One of the key parts of it is education. So we had a pretty sporadic education uh, partnership with our local uh, bicycle advocacy group, which reached about half of the elementary schools in Seattle prior to this uh, plan being adopted in this school year, we partnered with them to expand that and fund the expansion of the program. So it's going to be in every single public elementary school reaching third, fourth, and fifth grade students. 
and it's gonna include not just pedestrian uh, safety education, but also, or not only bicycle, pedestri bicycle safety education, but also pedestrian safety education in all three grades. We also have an encouragement campaign that includes incentives. So all schools can, in, can order free incentives from the Department of Transportation if they wanna do a walk or bike to school campaign. We will supply them with things like wristbands and temporary tattoos and stickers. Um, we will also provide staff to help support things like you see on the left, uh, walk and roll days. Uh, so that's where you know if, if a school wants to participate in walk to school day in September, we will set out a table, we will pro provide healthy snacks We'll be there with incentives. We'll be there with um, uh, yard signs that say um, stop for pedestrians and 20 miles an hour is plenty. And then we also, um, once a year, we're doing a Safe Routes to School kickoff event where we do things like um, free bicycle helmet giveaways and fittings for kids um, and provide uh, a, a bicycle rodeo so we teach uh, kids how to bike safety safely actually at this year's event there was a kid who showed up um, with a bike had no idea how to ride it and by the end of the event he was he was a um, master at it it was kind of amazing to see how quickly kids pick up on it um, in terms of engagement and uh, engaging the community we partnered with our department of neighborhoods on the left you see youth voice youth choice um, that's actually a citizen budgeting um, process that's new to Seattle where we're actually letting high school students uh, prioritize some of the city budget and they chose Safe Routes to School as one of their uh, top two priorities to fund. So we're getting some funding from that and it was a really cool um, partnership to, to see that, that Safe Routes to School was such a top priority for the kids. And then on the right, you see this is the first project that we completed. This is directly in front of a high school. It's a tactical urbanism project. We uh, completed that over the summer with this funding that we had from the Youth Voice, <coughs> Youth Choice. The school colors are, are orange and blue, so we made the, the, temp, the um, tactical urbanism purple, uh, the school colors, and um, pretty, pretty fun. So again, uh, walking and biking to school for elementary school students has increased about 60% over the past 10 years. Um, there's a long way to go. The, most kids are still arriving to school by private car, um, but we're moving in the right direction. It's not just the Safe Routes to School program. Obviously, there's a lot of other factors going into things, some systematic changes in the school district, but um, definitely feeling that we're, that we're moving in the right direction and that education and encouragement is a key to, to mode shift for, for public school, or school students in general. And um, with that, I'm gonna hand it over um, close this out. There you go. Yep. <laughs> So I'm John Knox White. I work for the uh, San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency. I am the programs manager. Uh, I oversee uh, programs, uh, transportation demand management related programs, our Vision Zero communications and education programs, um, and all of our safety education programs. And uh, over the last few years, we've kind of melded those all together. Um, uh, so I was, uh, I, I just wanted to, I'm gonna try to do this in five minutes. Um, give a quick overview on how we're doing our work. Uh, I, I was saying to Brian that I, I keep going back to the paragraph about uh, this panel and uh, realizing I think I wrote a different um, a different presentation from what's in there. Uh, and I think that the panel was described so well um, how to enable and, and what is the role of, of public agencies uh, in doing this. Um, uh, so in answering that for, for, for me and for San Francisco, I think our role, we really see uh, this as uh, being all about changing culture. So that we're not gonna be successful in encouraging the mode shift, and we can, we can help shift modes and whatnot, but until we start actually getting real strong community buy-in and, and community-wide buy-in that, uh, that mode shift wants to happen and that folks wanna support the, the infrastructure changes and the enforcement changes and everything else that, that are needed uh, to, to uh, make that mode shift happen. Um, the, the changing, change, you know, as our, I should say, the safety 
improvements. Uh, you know, I, I always say that I know I'll be successful when we uh, propose a bulb out in front of somebody's house and we don't get yelled at for removing the parking. Um, and I know that that's never going to happen, but uh, I, I do hope to, to we, we do hope to, to tamp that down a little bit. Um, the way in which we're, we're doing our work is we are really, uh, 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 Lindsay uh, you know, kind of went through how Vancouver's doing, really market uh, uh, research uh, intensive. Uh, an example of that is our, our uh, we did a, a bike web survey, uh, we had 600 respondents, statistically significant, and then held two focus groups uh, going out to really try to figure out what, how, what's it going to take to get San Franciscans to start biking. Uh, the first thing we found out was 62% probably will never bike, or say they will never bike. Um, that, right, snapshot in time. Yeah. <laughs> 10 years, five years from now, some of those 62% will be uh, in the maybe I will, or I'm sorry, 62% that never bike, 30% are not comfortable riding in San Francisco, right? Mm -hmm. And when we, but it was 52% never will bike in the city. That was what we decided at this point in time, at this snapshot. Um, so we, we set them aside um, because <coughs> We're not going to try to convince people who are pretty much, uh, I don't feel safe, I don't have a bike, I've never ridden a bike and I'm not interested in biking, I'm trying to convince those folks that they should get on a bike right now when you have 48% of the rest of the population to uh, focus your energies on, uh, didn't seem uh, to make uh, a lot of sense. Um, a little different, number safety ha is and has been for quite a while the number one reason people are not biking in San Francisco. Uh, that came across in our web survey, 47% of people said that is the reason they don't bike. Uh, when you talk to our focus groups, uh, it was the number one reason people don't feel safe on the streets. When you start talking about what are the, where are the places that they do feel comfortable, you're talking about parks, you're talking about pro uh, protected bike lanes, um, et cetera. Um, and so for us, uh, you know, that suggests that uh, we know that it's safer than that to bike in San Francisco, but it doesn't feel safe. And so a lot of the thinking that we're trying to, that we're, that we're doing is not just about how to make the streets safer, but also how to change the perception of safety, which is uh, when, when you're talking about trying to get people to do something they don't feel comfortable doing, it's almost as important. I mean, obviously, cutting down people getting hit and cutting down safety is, is goal number one, but if people feel that they're, going, that they're not going to um, uh, participate in bicycling or walking because they feel unsafe, that perception is really important as well. And it's something that we're doing a lot of our safety outreach around Vision Zero that we're trying to really balance, which, which is we do have a safety issue on our streets and we do want to reduce fatalities, but we also don't want to send the message that our streets are just you know death machines where you don't want to step out there and, and uh, get killed because that will cut down on people walking and biking. Um, similarly, we do have a, a, our strategic goal uh, in San Francisco is by 2018 having a mode share of under 50% private auto uh, use, and we met that last year. Um, so we are in the midst of a conversation about how to uh, how to make that. Uh, what is our next step? Uh, we're under our, our have a 2040 plan under underway right now. Uh, our program is using 80% uh, under non private auto use, um, and we haven't figured out how to how to qualify uh, Uber and Lyft and those kinds of vehicles at this point in time. Um, but I think they're quickly becoming private autos. Like I said, we, we segmented out, uh, again, did, we did this here, but we did we, we are trying to do this for almost every um, kind of campaign that we develop, who, who is our audience. We have 13% uh, of people who are riding at least once a week. We then have what we call uh, ready and willing, people who do bike but probably need some support and the hesitant but interested um, as we started thinking through this, the hesitant but interested were the folks that we should be encouraging to go out and bike recreational. So how do we start a ladder of, of, uh, of um, interests and in, in, in engagement so yeah, you're not going to go out and you know, tell somebody who's not biking right now, hey, you should get on a bike and bike to work every day because it's just really fabulous and you'll feel great. Um, but you might be able to get somebody to consider going out on a Saturday, going to the far farmer's market, uh, more recreational trips but in a place that they feel safe, etc. Uh, at some point in time, though, when they're going to the park, they're going to want to connect themselves from their home to their park on their bikes, and, and you can kind of engage them as, as they go up that ladder. So, um, uh, again, for, for us, it's, it's all about the, the culture. Safety being our number one barrier. Safety is one of our key, um, I'm not going to say encouragement programs, but one of our key focuses in encouraging and enabling people to uh, use active transportation. Uh, Vision Zero, uh, we are looking at infrastructure, but we have a lot of uh, education programs. Our first was related to people, um, <coughs> drivers yield, yielding to pedestrians in the crosswalk. Um, we went out and surveyed folks and found out that they didn't know what the laws were related to uh, pedestrians in the crosswalk. 
in California often has this reputation where everybody knows the pedestrian is king and our drivers stop on a dime, that's not true. Um, although I know other cities it's maybe worse. Um, and so we did go out uh, with, a, with, with a campaign working with the police. We do a lot of education programs in hand in hand where they do high visibility enforcement efforts. They get out there, we get media around the efforts that they're doing. We also are running campaigns at the same time. Uh, so we're informing people about what the rules are, that they can get ticketed, and they start getting ticketed, and then we get media about that. Um, that uh, program, which ran for about two and a half months as a pilot, uh, saw a 3% increase in drivers yielding to pedestrians on the uh, corridors where we were, uh, were doing that. Um, I don't know who was in the evaluation um, in this room, in the evaluation one. Uh, they were talking about outcomes and, and outputs. Uh, uh, on that one, we had uh, the, our Department of Public Health had people out for 43 weeks, one day a week on corners, counting people yielding to pedestrians, um, and, and did, were able to find a statistically significant uh, correlation in, in behavior, um, especially once the education and the enforcement started to happen. Um, secondly, we're doing a lot of, or we're trying a lot of different encouragement programs. Uh, one of the interesting things, uh, San Francisco, Silicon Valley, uh, I think it's uh, San Francisco residents are 20% less likely to uh, click like or share on anything related to uh, Twitter and Facebook and whatnot. Um, and we seem to be having kind of similar issues uh, related to some of the individualized marketing programs that we're putting out there, uh, getting people to interact with that. I don't know that it's, we haven't figured it out quite yet. Uh, but we uh, are launching a uh, a new program going out to people who are moving to the Bay Area, um, uh, trying to encourage them to uh, consider selling their cars, consider uh, their options, et cetera. I see that I'm already past five minutes, so I'm gonna go really quickly. Uh, Brian did a great job, DC talked to, also we are looking to do an in-school elementary um, bike program. Uh, elementary, we already are doing it in middle school and high school, it, uh, not all schools, but many schools teaching kids how to ride safely, so not how to ride a bike, but we are looking to add that to our elementary school. We fund um, um, adult bike to learn um, programs and are uh, doing a bunch of uh, safety and encouragement, education and communication campaigns. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Boston as the Active Transportation Director. Um, I do not have a presentation for you, which is a little bit of a bummer for me because we have some really awesome campaign images that I wanted to share. Um, but hopefully I will get the website to work and then I can show them there. Um, so City of Boston right now, we have about a 50% mode share in terms of transit, walking and biking. We have a very large percentage of people who walk to work, um, a growing percentage of people who uh, will bike, and then a, a fairly sizable amount who are going to take transit, uh, whether that's bus or the T, um, the rail lines. That said, uh, we have a goal of 2030, um, making those three modes closer to about three-fourths of all of the commute trips for Bostonians, which is a pretty big increase. Um, and it's not something that's going to happen overnight. Um, there are things that need to change. One is land use. Um, we can't have people really seriously considering taking uh, a bike or walking for their short trips when there's nothing within a short distance that is worth them walking to. Um, so that's one piece that is ongoing. Um, and then there's infrastructure changes. We need to have better sidewalks. We need to have better bike facilities. We need to provide better uh, infrastructure for people who are taking the bus because guess what? Our rail is not going to expand anytime soon in the neighborhoods that really need it. Another long-term thing, very expensive things. Um, so what are the things that we can do in the meantime to try to help shift people into these other kinds of travel for their short trips? Um, so thinking beyond just the commute, but also going to the park or to the farmer's market and connecting with the other resources that are already available for them in their community, places they might go already. Um, I wish that we had the, the money and the foresight to do some like serious analysis of what attitudes are for Bostonians, but <coughs> Uh, we don't. So, what we do know is that there are a lot of people who live in Boston who are underrepresented in the transportation system to date. We know that they are not the ones who are out there choosing to walk and bike. They're the ones who are already doing it um, and, and feel like their voice isn't there. So, we're lucky. We have a lot of colleges. We have a lot of privileged people. We have a lot of very wealthy people who can afford to live within a short walk or biking distance from their work. So how do we reach the rest of the people? That's what my team has been working on and what we're going to hopefully be able to expand in the next couple of years. 
Um, so the uh, first thing is trying to make active transportation a higher profile. Um, so we have just recently redes redesigned our city website, boston.gov. Um, the idea is that as we all think about transportation getting out of its own silo, we're thinking about the web getting out of its own silos. So previously, you would go to the Boston website, you'd go to transportation, you'd scroll halfway down the page, and then you'd see a link that says modes of transportation. Really sexy, you want to click on it, you want to know about the resources out there. <laughs> so instead, this time around, when we were still even in the pilot phase, and we were just introducing people to the different kinds of content that we want to be able to provide, and on top of that, provide them in six languages, um, we came up with a, a brand new guide uh, that is getting around Boston. Uh, it basically says nothing at all if you want to own your own car. You got your own guide someplace else. This covers everything, walking, biking, bike share, um, shared use, mobility, solutions, um, transportation network companies, cabs, if you're elderly, if you have a disability, all of the resources are all on the same page. It's attractively laid out and it's because it's a guide, it kind of lives near the top. Um, so it's a lot easier to find and just happen across, um, which is, uh, helpful. Uh, I know it's just on a website, a lot of people are not going to look for it, but it's there. Um, so it's one tool that's low cost that our partners in our, trans in our uh, technology department can do for us. Um, the second thing uh, is that we have a bike share system in Boston. It is growing. It is growing too slowly for the demand, um, but it is growing on the pace that we can manage and, and pay for. Um, we recently expanded uh, into a brand new neighborhood, uh, Roxbury. We were kind of along the edge of it. Uh, Roxbury is the traditional heart of black Boston. Um, uh, uh, probably like 35, 40 years ago, there was actually a vote for Roxbury to secede and become its own majority black city. Um, didn't go through, um, but that's their history, is they, are very, they have a very strong identity as a community. Um, and so when we expanded there, we wanted to be very thoughtful about how we did it. So we engaged, we paid uh, teenagers um, who are associated with various uh, development companies, um, not companies, corporations, so the neighborhood development corporations um, and nonprofits to go out and talk to people about bike share. One, because me as a white person coming in that's like, hey, biking is great, doesn't really fly. When you have teenagers who ride their bikes, who are doing wheelies, who think it's awesome, talking to people that they might already know because they're neighbors, it makes a big difference in the perception of this is a, a private company coming in to gentrify Roxbury and more like, oh, this might be something that I could use or my kids could use when they're 16 or older as per the requirements. Um, so we did that. We also are trying to be very intentional about how we promote the bike share. So talking about you can bike share to the Y, you can bike share to this park, you can bike share to Boston Latin School, you can bike share to these places that you're already going that are within the neighborhood and are not a super long distance, and hopefully there's a bike lane there. So that is also a way to get you around. Um, the last part of this, which is really cool, and this is why I wish that I had a presentation, is because I think that we have the most beautiful bike in all of Bike Share that I have ever seen. It was designed by uh, youth um, in Boston. They did some research on the history of Roxbury. So there are three women, um, black women leaders from Roxbury's history on the bike. It's beautiful, it's like pink and orange. Um, I, I will try to show anyone who wants to see a picture of it, I'm happy to show you many pictures of it. It is the most beautiful bike. And we did that for this neighborhood because we knew that this was going to be important to them. They care about representation. They want to see themselves. Um, we also uh, offer some traditional kinds of things. We do a youth cycling program where we go in school on bike education for two weeks at each school that we're at to teach kids how to ride bikes and to encourage them to do it. Um, we're tying that into a Safe Routes to School program that our public school systems just launched in the last year or so. Boston has a very strong history of busing, um, which some of you might be familiar with from the civil rights era of uh, schools not being uh, equal, um, and so we bust. Um, and we are very slowly moving away from that and very recently doing that. So um, tying this message into that overall campaign is important for us. Um, and maybe, maybe this website came up. Uh, not that I know how to show it to you. There we go. Um, so, and I have no idea how to scroll either. Mac user, okay, there we go. Um, so with the Boston Public Health Commission, we launched a campaign this year called I Bike Boston, 
what we did was find six people um, in Boston, not very difficult to do. There are many of us who live in Boston. But these are specific people who live in neighborhoods that we know are underrepresented and underserved and have health equity issues. So we picked them, we put them on bikes, we made them into like superheroes on their bikes um, to demonstrate the different ways that people choose to ride bikes. These are real people. You know, uh, Michelle on the, the right there, she rides in Roxbury. She has a ride every uh, Monday morning to get people going to work together. Noah, um, the second there, he is a young leader um, in the Dorchester community, getting more people on bikes and teaching them about bike repair. We've got Farah, who works for a neighborhood development corporation out in Austin Brighton, riding our, one of our hubway bikes. Um, Cheryl, who has bright red hair that you can't tell, and her son has this big, like, blonde poof of, a, of hair, um, and you see them all the time in East Boston, so you know them. Um, oh, we don't have, okay, well, we have another one who's uh, fairly famous in the um, Latino community, especially in like the Puerto Rican, Mexican uh, Latinos. We have other kinds too. Um, so we have materials that are in six different languages, and we're gonna build on that to provide more information about safe biking. We have a lot of new immigrants who don't necessarily know the customs in Boston or in the US, um, so we want to make sure that they have the materials ready to go. It's not shaming them, it's not hurting them, but it's putting them in places where they're going to be going anyway. We have immigrant centers at our libraries, they're going to go there. We have a city hall to go truck, it's going to go on that truck. So these kinds of things to help just reach people where they are and appeal to them um, as underrepresented already and showing them that they're not, that we see them and we recognize them. Um, so that's what I'm going to end with, so thank you. <laughs> through a CDC grant that our health commission got. Um, so we're going into our last year of that, so trying to make it sustainable. Um, my uh, program funding is maybe 110,000 a year, and that includes all of my part-time staff um, who are doing the work as well as any other pieces. Um, I have no idea how much the campaign costs because I didn't have to write the grant. <laughs> Um, our funding comes from three primary sources. One that is definitely available to you is the Federal Safe Routes to School uh, grants that you can use education and encouragement for. Uh, state Safe Routes to School grants, which are very similar, that just come out of your local state funds. Um, we also have a local transportation levy that funds Safe Routes to School. And then, um, the, as I mentioned, the speed enforcement in school zones goes directly into the Safe Routes to School. Levy. I think things work a little bit differently in Canadian cities than they do in American cities, but we do have um, part of an operating budget that's dedicated to promotion, and then we get some from our um, capital uh, corridor and spot improvements budget as well. Yeah. Uh, we, we do have some local funds uh, recently that have been put in. This is our first year of receiving them, but most of it's state funding, regional uh, regional air district funding, and then we actually have a sales tax for transportation in San Francisco. So some of that money has been set aside for promoting uh, bicycle and emotion. I have a question for John. It was interesting to hear about how there are staff from the public health department who were observing, uh, the effect, evaluating how effective your crosswalk enforcement and education was. And I'm interested, we, I know we talk a lot in our field about partnering with public health, and that seems like a really concrete outcome from a partnership, because I often get frustrated that we talk and talk and talk. So I was wondering if you could talk more about that partnership and like how you, know, how you got to that point that they're helping in that way. I, I would love to take credit for it, but it actually existed before I started this at MTA. Um, we, we have a really strong relationship between the MTA. We actually fund a couple of positions within uh, the public health department. Uh, we work with an epidemiologist there, and we've provided funding to uh, make sure that we have data and evaluation. Um, before I came on, um, there was a lot of work being done around pedestrian safety. Uh, some of you may have heard of um, our Walk First uh, work that was done. It was a real uh, data, a real deep data dive of collision data in San Francisco, and that was a partnership between the police department, the public health department, and the MTA. Um, you know, I, I have a strong belief that we really need to be, a, you know, 
when we're doing, when we started our best practice research for um, education programs, it's really incredible how little data there is out there about actually the, the outcomes, not just the outputs uh, of the campaigns that are being done out there. And I have a real belief that if we're going to be successful, we need to start really figuring out what works and what doesn't, not just are we talking to people so much, which is really important. I mean, that's one of the, you, you need to, we need to be able to say we reached a million people, but then the next, we need to go that next step. Um, our state funding, our, our, actually it's all FHW federal funding, um, has, you know, we've been building about $80,000 per project into the evaluation to fund the Department of Public Health to help us with that. I mean, it's, it, you know, it can be difficult. We do a lot of programs where they don't evaluate because we can't afford it, because we just can't get the funding for it. Um, but we do start from a position of how, what's it going to take to evaluate at a level that we, we, we feel is necessary and then cut that out as <laughs> budget discussions go on. So have you evaluated whether people's understanding of the laws changed at all? Yes, so we did okay. we did pre and post uh, surveys uh, for that project specifically. Okay. Um, and there was, uh, of the what we found was of the people who uh, reported uh, hearing or seeing the advertising, uh, I think uh, there was a 50% increase in the people who understood. In the, we, we, the, the question we asked was not, is this the law, yes or no, but how confident are you this is the law? Um, and it increased uh, significantly amongst people who had seen the campaign. Yeah. How are you using, or are you using um, the ability to evaluate your programs as a decision making, like should we do program X versus program Y, if program X is easier to evaluate, would you choose to do that, or are you using other other reasons to, to decide what sort of program to do? For us, I'd say yes and. I mean, we, we have evaluated programs that we can't see any benefit in, and so we stopped doing those programs. Um, but the other good thing, uh, like pedestrian, if you go out, if you if you do something and the evaluation shows it, it's a great tool for uh, going to your city council or the federal government or whoever else and say, trust us on this next one. We've actually shown that we can do something that works. Um, it, it makes them much more responsive to wanting to give you money. Uh, because I, th I, I, mean, I don't mean to talk too much, but. Um, one of the things I found is talking about some of these soft approaches is that you will find skeptics who just don't believe that it's going to work and, that, and whatnot. And you know, there are cases where it does and there are cases where it doesn't. The more that we can show the cases that do, the more likely we are to, to get that funding. I'm questioning the uh, point of view of Brian, maybe specifically. Obviously, enforcement is one of the five E's of Safe Routes to School. Can you tell me how you've encouraged or got your enforcement Law enforcement department involved in your safe bus school, and I guess any of you have had success with bringing law enforcement into it. Yeah, so it's uh, it's actually been uh, much better recently as a part of the Vision Zero program, which is which came from the mayor's office, right? So uh, as our the transportation head and the head of the police department both both report directly to the mayor, and so they were given a directive to work together on Vision Zero initiatives. Prior to that, it was spotty at best and depended on who was head of the traffic unit and in terms of whether or not they were receptive to um, doing crosswalk enforcement patrols or, or even doing school enforcement patrols and then um, uh, also getting funding from state and federal sources to pay for overtime for police enforcement in the school zones has been really helpful. How much do you guys think of this work as demand management strategies, but almost equal to the importance of building supply, whether it's supply for walking and biking or transit or driving. Can you talk a little bit to that particular lens for programmatic? We don't, we have TDM, but it's, in my opinion, not effective TDM. Um, it's a lot of like upfront sort of almost more mitigation type things of you're gonna have information available in your lobby, you're gonna have a space for an electric vehicle, and you'll put in some money for Hubway, maybe. Um, there's not really a, a stronger push to say, hey, no, do this or do that. They're kind of depending on the fact that they're attracting people who are gonna maybe choose these modes, right? Um, I would like to think of the I Bike Boston campaign in its next phase as more of a traditional individual marketing TDM campaign, um, but on a very small budget and not as tied to new development, but tied to new residents um, who might be moving into different neighborhoods a little harder to reach.
So for the, the perception surveys, they were two separate surveys that were conducted. So that was via our Talk Vancouver kind of online citizen panel. So that was the one that was really kind of a voluntary questionnaire, as we call it. So there would have been different people answering those two questions. It wouldn't have been the same, the same people. Um, for the market research that we um, hired an external consultant to, to, uh, to conduct, and so that was the motivations and barriers research, that was the same group of people answering all of those questions. Exactly, yeah, so it would be what, what are some of the barriers that they're facing um, and what could, pretend, if, if they were somebody who said that they would they were not interested in cycling whatsoever, it wouldn't have asked them those questions about motivation, so it would have asked them the questions about barriers, though. Yeah. Okay, I guess we'll call it enough. Oh, is there something? Yeah, <clears throat> question. Uh, I came in a little bit late, so if you answered this already, I apologize. But I think it was, uh, I can't remember if it was Sadiqan or one of the four, one of the DOT uh, uh, heads in, in, in the states famously said something like, uh, the education kind of encouragement programming doesn't really do a lot until you get the infrastructure in place first to kind of create the interest and, and give people kind of the space and the environment that they feel like they want to bike and then that what they want to bike then you come along with the education. Is that, are you finding that as well? If you address that already, I apologize. But she's, um, like, she was almost saying like, you know, some people would argue, no, you need to do both hand in hand. She was saying, really, you gotta kind of develop that interest yeah. and that's, that environment that works for people first and then come along with the education. I would agree with that to a point. I, mean, I think it's okay. kind of like incremental. Like it's, you know, you have to have something, you have to have some kind of base of infrastructure that's safe and feels comfortable for people yeah. and then you come in with the promotion. Then, you know, you up the ante a little bit more in the infrastructure and then, Likewise, and just kind of yeah, ratcheting it up. Yeah, thanks. I would think. No, I, I would say more or less the same thing. I mean, I, okay. I really, I, I, I approach the uh, education though, trying to, at least in San Francisco, the bike lash, the the, 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 the culture, the battle between cars and bikes, whatever you want to call that, yeah. um, is pretty vociferous right now. Mm -hmm. And so I really see part of what we're trying to do is not right. just get people riding their bikes, but just get people to see that riding their bikes is a valid. Yeah. Thing. I mean, I, so I talked about it when we, uh, one of my favorite factoids that came out of our bike survey was of the 52% who will never ride a bike, 25% or sorry, 50% of those people, over 50% of those people do not believe bikes have a legal right to the road. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Those are, those are, those, so we need to figure out how to talk to those people, sure. even if we're not encouraging but, them. But it's, it's, it's more heated now in part because there are more people biking. Yeah. Right. Right. And, and I remember back in the day when, <laughs> You know, bike advocacy groups and planners alike were all about, no, no, we'll get more people to bike. All we have to do is educate them right. and show them it's not scary. It's really not scary. Get on that 45 mile car away. It'll be all right. You know, and that wasn't working. And, and so it's good to hear that. I think Martha, we're moving kind of, we're moving in lockstep with infrastructure and education. They both help each other, yeah. This morning, Martha had a pie chart in her, well, I guess at lunchtime. Um, it was like 75% infrastructure, 25% yeah, yeah. programs, yeah. and I think that's probably about right. About right. Okay. Just curious in terms of the, the language used to describe, you know, these various users. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, you may see like there's kind of billets and cyclists, or yellow jackets and fast speed, blah, 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 and then maybe more casual cyclists taking their time. And if you're, you know, exploring or using kind of more preferred language or evolving language, so cyclists is a common term, people on bikes is maybe more normalized, and maybe some commentary around that language and what may be, has been more effective or less effective. I think we're, we're really, really clear about using people biking, people yeah. walking, people mm -hmm. driving, people, and I mean, sometimes it can lend itself to really awkwardly worded sentences sometimes, <laughs> and like, we just want to use the word cyclist. Um, but yeah, we're really careful with that language and we really try to focus, you know, we're people first, we're, a lot of us in the city are multimodal, we're making different choices for different kind of trips, and so it's, yeah, we're not those tribes. And in the U.S. example, same, Sam? Uh, so it, Seattle has a really powerful ad advocacy organization called the Seattle Neighborhood Greenways, um, and they've really pushed us really hard to get away from technical terms and to start using uh, those words that people can relate to as well because people don't you know especially like what what John was saying the quarter of the population who doesn't think 
um, bikes have a right to the road, but you know, getting them to realize that that's your neighbor, it could be your cousin, it could be you know your family member, it could be the person who lives down the street. That's a person. It's not a bike. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was sort of our emphasis was that I'm a person I ride my bike it's not so much about cyclists versus anyone else but to be inclusive and in all of our language at least coming out of my team is very like people first and we think about things in terms of a human being is doing this thing even another approach I've heard of that's really interesting we haven't really um, implemented this yet or really talked too much about it but the kind of when when you are cycling yeah. when you are walking like kind of trying to direct it at that person and, and not when people cycle Mm -hmm. making it personal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. I think we'll call it an afternoon and go drink some beers with engineers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.